I want to thank God for allowing us to participate with Him in the ceremony of communion. I think it's a wonderful experience to be able to unify with everything that was represented the promises of God because this is the fulfillment. This represents the fulfillment of thousands of years of promises to the children who follow Him. And a part of this uh, is what we're going to talk about today, a continuation of the authority of the believer. And today, instead of last week, we're talking about intersecting with God, how we have to move to where God is if we want to participate in what He's doing. Just because we sit in warm <coughs> pew doesn't mean God is operating in the, His entirety <coughs> right here in the pew next to us. But today I'd like to talk about inheriting from God. How is it that someone gains authority? Our text is going to be Galatians 3.29 and Romans 8.17. <clears throat> if you'd like to turn to those. And... Galatians 3.29 simply says, And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Romans 8.17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. So here's two passages that talk about us being heirs. You can only be an heir if there's something to inherit. I mean, if you're an heir to a debtor, what do you have? Zero. Nothing. Evidently, we are heirs to something, something glorious, so that we can claim to be heirs to that which God has promised. So, <clears throat> talking about inheritance, we want to talk about how this influences our ability to be authoritative within Jesus' kingdom. And when I speak of inheritance, there's several things I could be speaking of. First, we have an inborn physical outward characteristics that we inherit from our parents. In my case, distant relative. I just found out about a year or so ago that I look almost exactly like my great-great-grandfather on my grandfather's mother's side. Someone sent a picture of him and I had no idea who he was. I looked at it and it goes, oh, I took a picture in the 1800s. <laughs> had the same mustache, same neck, same face. It was quite amazing. So yes, we inherit from genetic past through our family tree. Be traits such as eye color, skin color, height, weight, all sorts of things. We inherit these. Sometimes these traits are very strong and sometimes it's very weak. But they're inherited traits. And secondly, we have the inborn abilities that we inherit. Skills. In my case, I inherited fishing skills from my father's side of the family, hunting skills. From my mother's side, they had skills that were very good in woodworking and mechanics. So I got kind of a double dose of skill sets in here. I did not inherit very good math skills because evidently my family wasn't real good in math. So we inherit things from our families this way. And uh, Thirdly, when we talk about inheritance, 
we, we talk about the act of inheriting. This is how families pass down things down through their families. And I'm sure all of you here have something that was probably passed down from someone else in their family, either mothers, fathers, grandparents, great-grandkids, whatever. Uh, these are treasures that, for some reason, they were passed down to someone who was deemed worthy to have that item and then passed down to someone else who was worthy to have that uh, item. And so it is in all of our families. Now, uh, as we see inheritance in the fleshly world around us, so too we have to recognize that there is a spiritual world that is essentially patterned after what we see in the physical world. But in the spiritual realm, we are inheritors of the spiritual natures of our Creator. Okay? I'm sure that, you know, our physical characteristics may be somehow related to the physical appearance of God, if we could call it that. But since I've never seen God firsthand, I can't really speak to that. But, uh, in my opinion, I doubt that God has, you know, some giant head with six legs, because if He did, we'd probably look more like a big grasshopper or something than what we look like. And my basis for that is because it says in Genesis that we are created in the image and likeness of God. So I'm positive in my own mind that we are in our outward appearance very much like God. Now, spiritually, we have the inborn abilities of God as well since He is our spiritual Father. What are some of these inborn traits? Well, many of the skills that we are born with are creative traits. They're inborn within us. They are passed down to us through this creative Father because that is one of the great things about Him is He is creative. He loves to create. He created everything for us right here. So, we are essentially very much like Him just because we're creative. However, there's a limit to our abilities when they're not coupled with the spiritual nature of God and when we don't practice them when we're unified with His purpose. It's just like practicing a piano. If we practice the piano, the closer we will get to being able to play some great complicated piece of music like Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto Number no. 3, which only a few people in the world can play hardly at all because his hands were about that long. And so he composed music for someone whose hands are about that long. My hand's about half that big. So, as a person practices these inborn spiritual natures and skills, we will become more able to be closer to God in nature through this life practice. And the these godly traits will be more likely to be expressed in our daily lives. So what are these expressions, these inborn kind of things that we have that demonstrate our closeness to God? We'll turn over to Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. These things demonstrate that we become closer to God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. These are manifestations that we have indeed inherited something from God as our nature without God is contrary to these. Hate unhappiness, 
turmoil, impatience, anger, evil, unfaithfulness, disobedience, selfishness. These are the world's concepts that show we are neither unified with God in His purposes nor an inheritor of His nature. And when we look around at the world, it's pretty obvious that most of the world is not an inheritor of God's nature. But armed with this knowledge, we still have to know how we become inheritors from God in the first place. Now that we know it's possible. And while some parts of all of us is inherited from God simply because we are all created in the likeness and image of God. For us to be able to fully gain the authority that the Bible says we are due, we have to become what? A joint heir with Jesus. Because only He has been given the authority that God had given man from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Man lost that. He fumbled that away. So in order to be able to be a joint heir with Jesus, we first have to be acceptable to Him to be able to inherit that which He has for us. Now I'm just going to throw out a question. If any of you have an offspring that's a real hellraiser, beer drinker, you know, whatever you want to call that's running from God and you're about to die and you have an inheritance, are you going to give it to this person? Probably not, because you don't want to see that person squander that which you worked a lifetime in a godly pursuit to give to bless your offspring. We have to become acceptable to God to gain the inheritance He has for us. How do we become acceptable to Jesus? Acts 2.38, that tells us how. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be ye baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The first step to authority is we repent of our sins. And what is this for? Repentance means to turn away from and go back to. So we are to turn away from the covenant that Adam and Eve swore to Satan in the Garden of Eden and return to the covenant that Jesus had to re-strike in His blood with God at Calvary. This means that we give up our sinful and fleshly nature and then are qualified to be given the spiritual nature of God instead. So after we repent, we are told that we need to be baptized. So what is this act for? Well, once we're qualified to be forgiven, we should go through the act that actually stamps us with the seal of the forgiving nature of God and makes us joint heirs with Jesus, and that is the act of baptism. Baptism is an act which was directly taken out of Judaism. It just didn't fall out of the sky. One of the commandments from the category of the Jewish statutes, these were called chuchim, this was called the mikvah, or the ritual immersion bath. And the word, this mikvah, means a collection or a gathering together of waters. And usually it was associated with a collection like in a cistern or a pond or you know, one of their complexes. But we know this about the mikvah 
that you had to have at least 120 gallons of water in this in order to be considered an acceptable vessel for this. Now you know how you had the six stone water pots in the Gospel of John. Each one of those is divisible by 20. Six times 20 is 120. So they had enough water to make this a ritually pure immersion uh, vessel. So not only did it have to have 120 gallons, but it, in order to for cleanse one from sins, the sinful nature, it had to be filled with living water. It's called Maim Chaim, and it had to be from a spring, spring-fed. Well, the Jordan River was spring-fed, came right out of the bottom of Mount Hermon. They used it. The springs at Bethlehem were pushed uphill seven miles to the Temple Mount by gravity through brilliant Roman engineering to feed the ritual immersion complex at the Temple Mount. Massive waterworks. It was very important for them, this concept of cleansing one to come before God. Okay. This Jewish immersion involved the way individuals demonstrated their eligibility for the full privileges and responsibilities within the community. And as such, Paul and the disciples used this act of ritual immersion or baptism that we call it now to demonstrate the new believer's eligibility for what? For full privileges and responsibility within Jesus' kingdom. Paul and the disciples were well aware of what the mikvah was in Judaism, and it was called the womb of the world. And it was a new birth, separating one from the pagan world. They said a little child just born, or a child of one day. These were Jewish idioms referring to a convert who had just come out of the baptismal, the mikvah, who had risen in newness of life. So these were Jewish concepts. The fact is here that we're all spiritually unclean and we have to be made spiritually clean in order to inherit from God. God had commanded in the Bible that whenever someone became ritually impure, he or she had to go immerse themselves in the mikvah bath in order to restore one's status in the community. The entire 15th chapter of Leviticus is provides us specific details about how a woman is ritually impure and becomes ritually pure after her period. Baptism is all about signifying that you have been given a new life within Jesus' kingdom. You are a new creature. It is to be a life of blessings and responsibilities within the believing community that demonstrates the power of God manifesting through our lives in the community. It also demonstrates through obedience that a person is spiritually clean and is eligible for full privileges and service within Jesus' kingdom upon the earth and as such, this means that we are then able to inherit what? Power and authority within the operations of Jesus' kingdom on the earth. Now, there's a lot of people out here teaching, oh, you got the power and authority, you just need to do this and that, and you know, all kinds of stuff will happen. Well, Maybe they need to be asking, Jesus, is this the operation and purpose that you want me to be doing? Okay? 
God can do whatever He wants, but just because we have a desire to do something doesn't mean that that's the purpose that God has for us. In short, if we want to have true authority either within the earthly realm or the spiritual realm, we, we must do what is necessary according to the rules laid out by the King of Jesus' kingdom. Okay? Number one is you have to repent and be baptized for the remission of the sin and then we have to receive what? A bowl of soup? Some bread? A winning lotto ticket? Power over others to manipulate things? No. We are told that we will receive the Holy Spirit. This is the asset. This is it. This is the asset, the inheritance which God gives those who are willing to unify within Jesus' existence. It's the Holy Spirit which allows us to exist as authoritative within Jesus' kingdom on the earth. The world asks us just one question. They want to know by whose authority we operate. That's what they asked Jesus. By whose authority do you do this stuff? If we have no power and authority within our daily lives, then we have to ask ourselves if we truly believe and accept as true that which Jesus has told us. As believers, we have to begin to recognize the Spirit in and around others. We have to begin to open our spiritual eyes, that which God has given all of us as believers, and start recognizing it first and foremost. Because we war not against flesh and blood that we see with these earthly <laughs> eyes. We war against spiritual things. And unless we can recognize the Spirit, how are we ever going to win a battle? We won't even be able to win a skirmish. So if the battle is not in the fleshly realm, why do so many people just love to dwell in it? And wallow in it? Seem like they enjoy being depressed and angry and hateful and unbelieving. They enjoy it. The authority of the believer exists within Jesus' kingdom and we have to go and intersect with it. We have to go out as the disciples did and go where God wants us to operate and in going, in obeying the commandments we receive from our Master, we thereby exercise or allow that Holy Spirit to flow out from us in a creative and empowering manner to the people whom God is drawing Himself to. He's drawing them to Him and into Jesus' kingdom. God wants to bless all of us within the service of His kingdom. When we experience the authority of God in our lives, we grow as individuals, and our experience, and our belief, and our faith grow as well. We are able to recognize what God tells us to do what, where He tells us to go, what He tells us to do in the working in His kingdom. And this is truly experiencing the blessings of God in our lives as 
the seed of Abraham. And today, I want you to think about what this means to you, inheriting from God. It means everything that God promised to Abraham, you are able to receive them. These blessings have been passed down to you through Jesus. Now you can either choose to accept them and operate within Jesus' kingdom or just choose to warm the pew. Most people just choose to warm a pew, unfortunately. Because out of fear, they're afraid to step forth and claim that inheritance, that Spirit of God that empowers us. But it's people's choice. Now, is there anybody here that needs prayer? Because prayer is something that God lays on our heart as working in the kingdom. It's a mission to pray for others, to make sure their needs are met. And if you have a specific need that we haven't prayed for, now's a good time. I think basically everybody here is believers. But many of you might have specific needs. Yeah, Jamie. I'd like to offer up prayers for my sister Janine. Okay. Uh, she's been dealing with some health issues and is trouble having trouble finding some answers. And okay. She just turned 65, and we'd like to get her some answers. All right, Janine. Janine. Okay. Well, we'll pray for Janine. Anybody else? Continue All right. To continue to pray for B. Asher. Okay. I have heard from B in the last couple of weeks. I've called a couple of times. I haven't heard back. And uh, so I'll just keep trying to find out anything that's going on with him. Chris Barton needs to uh, find a job. Chris Barton. Okay. All right. Need to pray for my brother-in-law, Junior Revis. That's uh, in stage four cancer. Okay. I have ordered that series, 11, 11 hour series on cancer and how to, to get rid of it, how to be healed and understanding the medical system. It hasn't come in yet. As soon as I get it, I'll let you know. And that may be something that he might want to watch immediately. Um, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we give you thanks and, and glory honor, give you the, the praises you deserve as best we are able. Lord, we thank you and give you praise that you are the master of all. You have power and authority over the, the healing of our bodies. And as we ask that you are gracious to heal, Lord, we just ask right now that you would be with B. Asher, that you would continue to work a healing in his life. Let him know that you are with him. Lord, we just ask for a, a healing for Junior Revis, that you would be with him. Let him know as well that you're working in his life. Lord, we just come before you and just ask that you would be with Janine, that you would open up her mind and her heart to the workings of your power in her life, that you would give her the answers that she seeks in the way that she would know that you are in control. Lord, we just ask that you would be with uh, Paul's friend. You'd help him to get the job that he needs. 
and that it would be given to him in such a way that uh, he would know that you've been working in his behalf. <clears throat> Lord, you know all of our needs, spiritually and physically, and you're Lord over all. And I just pray that you would be with all of us, all of those of the church that aren't here today, that you would be blessing us and giving us the power and authority to go out and do your will in your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.